Um, yes. Okay. So, uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. For all of you who are joining us uh, for today's live session from different parts of the world, uh, my name is Ahad Ahmed. I'm part of the organizing committee of the Virtual Festival of Facades. So this is week seven uh, of the Virtual Festival of Facades, and uh, today's uh, region we are touching on a on a, on a high-rise tower in East Africa and Kenya called the Britum Tower. Uh, I'll introduce that project um, very soon and our speakers uh, shortly. Uh, but just to give you an overview, so we started this Virtual Festival of Facades. Uh, 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 on the 10th of August, uh, the response has been phenomenal. We have uh, 270 speakers from across the globe participating, uh, talking on different uh, projects um, and uh, topics all related to facades. And uh, today's session uh, brings us to Africa, back to Africa. We had a few presentations from Africa last week and the week before that, if you recall. So today we are back to a project uh, which I am uh, very well aware of. I've personally seen the project. I've, uh, I've, I've also heard a lot of uh, about this project and I've also visited uh, the project, so it's, uh, it's a very interesting project. But before I get into that, uh, uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, so uh, you can you can uh, visit the complete schedule of the Virtual Festival of Facades on vfof.zagwf.com. Um, you can also uh, get uh, watch these presentations, network with people, fix meetings, see products, see projects uh, uh, on our uh, mobile app, which is uh, available on the App Store and uh, on uh, Google Play. Uh, so, uh, yes, so please do join in um, uh, the Virtual Festival of Facades. Uh, we end on the 30th of uh, October, but uh, given the response and the kind of uh, feedback we are receiving, we will uh, be extending this till the end of uh, November. Okay, so dwelling straight into today's topic, Britum Tower. So Britum Tower is a 200-meter uh, high-rise uh, building in uh, Nairobi, uh, in Kenya. Uh, it's it's a very uh, interesting uh, uh, building because it has uh, vertical uh, louvers made out of terracotta, which which uh, span up uh, to the height of the building. Uh, so uh, it makes it a little unconventional uh, when compared to other uh, <clears throat> high-rise skyscrapers. And plus, it's also in uh, Africa, which is not uh, known for uh, uh, skyscrapers. So today's uh, presenters. Uh, are two people who were involved uh, in the uh, design and execution of uh, this uh, tower. Uh, we start off first with uh, our first presenter, that is uh, Ian Duncombe. He's a board director at uh, Chapman BDSP. They are uh, sustainability uh, engineers. Uh, so Ian is based in the London office of Chap Chapman BDSP. He leads a multidisciplinary engineering teams delivering uh, major master plans and building projects across EMEA. He studied his building engineering at the University of Bath School of Architecture and Building Engineering, where being taught by Ted Happold sparked a passion for innovative environmental engineering and a holistic design approach. So Ted is going to be um, the uh, first presenter for today. Uh, he is... Um, going to be talking on the passive uh, design of this high-rise building, balancing the need for daylight and shade in an equatorial climate and maximizing the potential for natural ventilation uh, in a high-rise office tower. Um, after uh, Ian completes, we will then have a presentation from Devendra Lada, who is the director of Prime Aluminium. So Prime Aluminium were the facade contractors uh, over this uh, on this project, and uh, they've uh, oversees the company's business development, project management, and finance operations. Uh, functions. He holds a bachelor's in engineering uh, degree from uh, UMIST Manchester, UK, and a master's in management and IT from the Cranfield University, UK. Uh, they've initially worked as a consultant for uh, BRE, which is a building research uh, establishment, and uh, Turner Townsend LLP in London, through which he gained uh, experience on major pro mega projects such as the Heathrow Terminal 5 and Wembley Stadium. Uh, so these are our two presenters for today. They will be touching upon uh, the strategy and planning of the facade execution, combining all the facade elements to work together and the lesson learned and the final outcome. So these are our two presenters uh, for today. So we will start with uh, Ian, uh, who was involved in uh, designing uh, uh, the facade strategy along with the architect's gap from South Africa. And uh, following him will be Dave. Uh, once they are done, we'll take a joint Q&A at the end. So uh, I will uh, stop my screen share here and would request uh, Ian to please start uh, uh, your screen share. Dave, if I can request you to just uh, mute yourself and turn off your camera till Ian finishes his presentation. So over to you, Ian. 
Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and um, as has been explained, I'm, I was uh, one of the key designers for, for the project from the outset when we started in 2000, 2011, back end of 2011. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the journey that we went through and the design processes, um, particularly in relation to the facade, but it'll give you a bit, bit of background about the project um, as, a, as a whole and some of the ambitions for, for the client, which we were able to realise um, through, that, through that design. So um, we had a, a, an international team working on the project, um, Gap Architects out of uh, South Africa, um, Howard Humphreys with a local structural engineer. We, we were environmental MEP and lighting engineers uh, with a local MEP consultant, Materia Associates. Uh, we had local cost consultants and the main contractor was Laxman Bai. In terms of the brief, um, set out for us. We're, the project is about 300,000 square foot of, of lettable uh, space. Um, they were very keen to follow a sustainable um, uh, agenda. It's one of the reasons that they, they brought this international team together in, in the first place. Um, and they were happy to invest in sustainable features provided there was a clear uh, return for them. Uh, they wanted to very much minimize the amount of provision made by the landlord um, for the tenants. And we, we ended up with relatively simple systems that facilitated that. Uh, there was, they were keen to reduce the dependence on, on air conditioning, which for uh, those of you who don't know the Nairobi climate, realizing it's so close to the equator might think would be a bit of a challenge. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you why, how, why and how that was, was possible. Um, they wanted a very flexible space. This was a bit of a landmark building. They weren't exactly sure of what the tenant mix would be at the, at the outset. So that was flexibility was, was key. And inevitably, the, the local utilities are relatively unreliable. So we had to deal with that in, in, in the design as well, make it as robust as possible. Um, so the specific design challenges were the frequent um, utility power outages, uh, interruption to mains water, limited sewer capacity, um, bedrock very close to the surface and, and also in terms of procuring um, a, a, a building of this quality uh, we have to face up to the fact there were some local supply chain challenges uh, as well particularly on elements such as the uh, facade. In terms of our general approach um, to sustainability we, we, we don't follow a traditional approach where the disciplines work separately we're, we're very keen that architecture structures an MEP environmental engineering are brought together uh, through a passive design process, uh, which benefits the project and hopefully minimizes the, uh, the amount of MEP services in, in the building. So that, that um, philosophy aligns well with what the client was looking to achieve. Um, this means we, before we even think about MEP systems, we're thinking about the form of the building, the layout of the site, um, and particularly relevant for this talk, the um, the composition of the facades um, and how they can help us to achieve comfort and low energy consumption. So in terms of, from an energy point of view, we have a four step approach. So we try to minimize demand at source through passive design measures. Um, we look at efficiencies, energy efficiencies in the systems that we put into the buildings. We look at a, an appropriate level of uh, renewables and then residual um, energy demand as uh, supply being met from uh, as clean or alternative as possible. And we back these um, processes up with uh, a lot of advanced design methodology using computer simulation um, and um, these days parametric analysis as well that really allows us to optimize um, components in the, in the design. Uh, and that approach is applicable whatever the climate, obviously the, the particular responses are different uh, for different climates, uh, but the general approach is, is the same. And um, in, in Nairobi, we actually have a, a, a fantastic uh, climate for passive, passive design. So um, you might be surprised to hear that it only has 50% more hours above 28 degrees centigrade than we, than we do in London. Obviously it's warmer, warmer temperatures generally um, over the year, um, but also there's very high amounts of diffuse um, radiation um, and reasonable cloud cover a lot of the time, which, which and that diffuse radiation helps a lot with, uh, with daylighting. Um, and the key to, to Nairobi's um, uh, moderate and temperate climate is the fact that it's altitude. So it's 1800 meters um, above sea level, which is the level of a, a lot of European ski resorts, just to put it in some sort of um, context. So 
Um, as I said already, the peak temperatures are not too, too prolonged in, in terms of their time frame. Um, daytime temperatures rarely go below 15 degrees centigrade, and there's a good diurnal range as well. And as I said, abundant diffused um, daylight. So have, we've got this sort of great uh, mix of conditions for passive design. So how do we go about exploiting that? And I think when you look at references in, in Nairobi, most of, the, most of the office buildings are what we would call climate rejecting. So they've got this great natural resource, but they tend to turn their backs on it. Um, and adopt climate rejecting forms. So um, windows tend to be relatively small, the openings are relatively small, cores are not positioned um, to take advantage of natural ventilation or, or, or daylighting. Um, so, you know, we wanted to turn our, our back on those forms and, and try to do something which we would consider to be climate embracing. So we wanted to get good solar shading to reduce overheating, um, maximize the, the use of daylight, maintain the external views because the site is uh, elevated up on upper hill. It has a fantastic, uh, fantastic views. Um, and also to take advantage of natural ventilation for as much of the year as we, as we could. Um, we did some early wind studies ar around, the, around the conceptual form of the building. Um, and there were relatively few uh, wind issues to deal with uh, uh, at ground level. Uh, we started to look at um, the sun path, um, which obviously is useful in terms of shadow analysis, but one of the techniques that we use um, a lot um, and in a more refined way, I would say, is uh, that of irradiation mapping, where we look at total solar radiation falling on surfaces um, over what, whatever period we, we choose. And these are the um, annual irradiation maps uh, for the various elements of the, of the facade on Britain Tower. So what, what we found was that, perhaps not surprisingly, the sun goes pretty much straight over the, over the top. So the east and west elevations actually have the more um, solar energy falling on them over the year, typically about 30% more than the uh, north and south. North and south facades are, are, are pretty similar. Um, and the inclined facades in the conceptual building, not surprisingly, receive about 5% more solar energy than, than the vertical facades. In terms of setting criteria, as I said, daylighting and natural ventilation were the two um, key uh, design criteria we were trying to meet through our passive design. So we were aiming for a 2% daylight factor over as much of the floor plate as we could. We, our target was more than 80% of, of the floor plate uh, to allow the artificial lighting to be, to be switched off. Um, and in terms of natural ventilation, we decided to adopt um, uh, adaptive comfort limits and look for a maximum of 5% of ours um, exceeding the adaptive comfort limit. The advantage with that is obviously there's great acclimatization to those warmer temperatures and it does allow slightly wider tolerance on the, uh, on the design temperatures. Um, in terms of the things at our disposal, the parameters at our disposal um, for the design, we could obviously look at the amount of glazing on, on the facade. Uh, we could look at the um, opening window configuration and area. We could look at the glass type uh, and also the, um, the shading screen that was a part of the concept in terms of optimizing that, you know, the, the characteristics of that. So we set up an optimization process uh, following this, this flow chart, uh, developing a base case and then going through a, ver a variety of uh, optimization processes is dealing with each of those elements I, I just I just described, uh, all the time trying to refine uh, the parameters and aim for our, our target design criteria. Uh, in terms of the natural ventilation temperatures, we used a, a thermal modeling uh, process. Um, and then in our um, setting up of the base case, obviously fairly extreme, if you look at say taking a sealed building without any ventilation openings, you're, you're not surprisingly um, exceed your target temperature criteria for a very large part of the year. But then we, this was an issue to process and we started to just add in the, the other elements such as shading, um, facade, minimal facade openings, um, solar control glass and uh, you know, things like controls such as artificial lighting control because we knew we were aiming for good daylighting. Um, in terms of the solar control glass, um, we were looking at a single glazed uh, facade, there was little advantage and probably economic justification in going for, for double glazing. 
Um, and from the outset, we were looking for a selective glass, which was fairly unusual uh, in, in Nairobi um, and was one of the challenges we had through the procurement process, to, to be honest. And, um, but we were looking for a selective glass that had high light transmission, um, but relatively low, low G value. Uh, the baguettes were a key part of the, the architectural concept, the, um, the terracotta uh, ceramic baguettes. Um, and so we started to look at different forms for that, square sections, uh, flat and, and circular, and the impacts that they would have on um, daylighting, uh, shading, air penetration through them, um, and, and the views out as, as well. So this was a, a process we went through as a, as a team and with, with the client. Um, through that, we arrived at um, an optimized shading proposal, because obviously in an ideal world, we would tune the, um, the spacing of the baguettes and the proportions of the baguettes on each elevation to perform as it needed to, given the, the variation in solar radiation falling on them, as I described a little, little bit earlier. Um, and so in an ideal world, we would have had on the north and south elevations, perhaps slightly wider spacing than the east and west and on the inclined facades, um, a different pattern uh, and spacing um, again. Um, this, this didn't sort of survive the aesthetic uh, reviews, I, I would say, and uh, we ended up with a consistent spacing on, on all elevations, which obviously we still then had to, uh, we still had to test and make form against our design criteria. But the good news was, um, obviously this was a, a sort of a square tower, the center core, and we got um, very good daylight factors. So our target was 80, um, it was 2% across 80% of the floor plate. We achieved that even on the, uh, the largest of the, of the floors. Um, at the top of the building, we were close to 92% um, of, the, of the floor area at, at that daylight factor. Um, and similarly, um, we managed to get, you know, controlled um, daylight levels on sunny, you know, under sunny conditions across the whole floor plate as well. In terms of the opening windows, um, we tested different configurations of opening window, um, but we knew from experience that probably having two levels of window would be an optimum arrangement, so a high level um, that can provide good background ventilation, and then a lower level close to the desk, uh, which can provide larger quantities of air under the, under the warmer conditions. Uh, so that was the arrangement that we um, adopted. Of course, a key factor was how much of the facade area should be should be openable. Um, so we did some testing on that, and uh, it follows a law of uh, diminishing returns. And uh, so we chose a sort of what seemed to be an optimum position, which was 24% of the facade um, being openable, which was which is quite a reasonable quite a reasonable amount. Um, but that uh, was made a significant reduction against our initial base case um, in terms of uh, reducing the hours of overheating. So then this is just really a summary of, of obviously there was a lot of process and a lot of iterations behind this, but the sort of summary story, if you like, of how we reached our target of getting to below 5%. So having gone from our base case, which was about 32% overheating, um, we then improved the, um, the solar control through the, through the glazing that brought it down. Um, daylight link controls, turning off the artificial lighting, um, further improvement, um, then varied sh shading. Um, and then final changes were further refinement on the, on the uh, glazing. So a slightly lower um, G value with a small sacrifice in, in light transmission, um, but also um, taking advantage of, uh, of night, night cooling. Um, and the uh, slightly higher opening areas, which I just talked about as, as well. We went through a mock-up process. So this was the, the mock-up at Prime Aluminium's Works in, in, in Dubai. Um, so that was quite a good session going through, um, obviously things such as how the windows would actually um, open as well as just achieving the right, the right areas. Um, so that, that, was, that was a good session that we had more, more than one of them. Um, and then in terms of the, of course, the facade is only works in this way if the systems inside and the design of the tenant spaces 
um, works in harmony with with that with that design. So we were we we sort of developed a, a series of um, different fit out scenarios which tenants could adopt um, to which worked in harmony with the uh, with the, the ventilation um, the glazing systems uh, at the elevation. So we had four potential fit out solutions. So tenants could go completely open plan natural natural ventilation obviously with that slightly wider range of, of thermal conditions inside. Um, we had a, an open plan, but mixed mode ventilation, so they could introduce mechanical ventilation to, uh, to supplement the, uh, the natural ventilation. They could then take a step further and provide some comfort cooling uh, as well, which obviously would give them complete control over the year uh, of, of temperatures. And then we had fit out scenarios as well, where um, instead of completely open plan, there were perimeter offices um, catered for as, as well. Um, so, in order to facilitate those um, fit out solutions, we inc introduced uh, a band of louvers at high level around the perimeter of the facade, so tenants could, could tap into that uh, to meet their requirements in terms of if they were introducing mechanical ventilation systems. We also introduced um, on, the, on the floors that didn't have access to the plant floor for uh, tenant, or tenant heat rejection equipment. Uh, we introduced some vertical louvers as well, so they could fit that out um, on their particular uh, on their particular floors. We did we looked at different uh, environmental certification um, uh, and rating methods um, early on in the in the project. Kenya at the time didn't have its own uh, rating system, so we considered Bream, Bream, Lee, um, and Green Star. Green Star we'd had other experience of uh, in, in Africa. Um, but in the end, we adopted um, EDGE and Britam Tower was actually the first EDGE certified um, building in, in Kenya. Um, we had a, a lot of sustainability features in addition to the passive features I, I've just described, um, such as not providing any hot water to the, to the um, washrooms uh, and the restrooms up, up the building, um, presence detection on the lighting control in landlords areas and, and so on. Um, and um, a lot, a lot of water recycling. Um, uh, so we collected and recycled rainwater. We had a borehole on, on site um, and we had a full non-possible um, water dis uh, system as, uh, as well for toilet flushing through, through the building. Um, and over, in overall terms on edge certification, these contributed to a 35, um, 39% energy savings, 50% water savings, and about 30%, 38% less embodied energy um, compared with uh, a base rated um, building. In terms of energy, our own calculations um, differed slightly from that. We, we reckon that a fully air conditioned uh, building in Nairobi consumes of equivalent size, consumes about 96 kilowatt hours per meter square per annum um, total energy. And um, is that obviously relatively low because there's, there's little heating demand um, due to the, um, the temperate conditions throughout the year. Uh, but our prediction for Britam Tower, if it was fully naturally ventilated, um, as it's designed to be capable of, um, is only 34 kilowatt hours per meter square per annum. So a very significant um, reduction. So that's a, a shot of the, a um, couple of shots of the com completed building. Um, it's really stunning when, when, you, when you see it and it's got a very prominent um, position on the, uh, on the Nairobi uh, skyline. Uh, so you get some great views from, from, up, from up the tower. Um, so just to, to summarize then, um, our brief was, was quite demanding, quite onerous, the brief that Britam set, but I think we've delivered uh, between us a, a fantastic grade A tower, um, which can attract international uh, tenants. We've uh, turned our back on a lot of the local uh, typologies of building and we've, we've produced a genuinely um, climate embracing uh, form that takes great advantage of the um, natural resources of the climate and the daylight, uh, diffuse daylight is available in Nairobi. Um, significant energy savings as well. I think it's an exemplar building in the way it blends uh, these passive design features with the, with the MEP design as well. Um, and incorporates a, a very wide range of uh, sustainable um, 
sustainability features uh, as well. Um, and on the back of all of this, the, the building is winning a significant number of awards and has done since it, since it opened. So it, it won an Emporis Skyscraper Award, which is the first African building um, to, to do so in its nine year uh, history. And in 2019, we won the uh, CTBUH, the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat overall uh, MEP award uh, uh, as well for the way that we address the, uh, the issues set by the brief. Um, okay, so that's a, a summary from me and Dev now is gonna talk about the, uh, the implementation um, stage of the, of the project. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Dave, if you can just uh, share your screen. So that was Ian Duncombe uh, talking on the sustainable design strategy uh, on the Britain Tower. Uh, now let's get to hear on how this was uh, built uh, by the facade contractors, Prime Aluminium. So Dave, uh, just turn on your camera and uh, you can start your presentation. Uh, thank you, Ahat, and thank you, Ian. Uh, interesting presentation. And uh, so uh, my name is Devendra Lad. I'm from Prime Aluminium. Uh, we are the facade contractor for the project. And uh, what I wanted to do was just to give a quick presentation on the execution of the project. So the title of the presentation is uh, Building the Facade for Britam Tower Nairobi. Uh, what I'm gonna be talking about is the strategy and planning that we used before and after the award. And uh, then we'll talk about the combining of all the facade elements uh, to work together. And then uh, lessons learned in the final outcome of the project. So in terms of the contents of the presentation, as I mentioned, strategy and planning, uh, combining all the facade elements, what we wanted to, what I wanted to show you is to uh, how we understood the facade concept and the to take you through an installation journey. Uh, so, in terms of strategy and planning, uh, before the award, uh, for us, uh, Britam Tower was a big project. So, from the moment we received an inquiry from the main contractor, uh, we said to ourselves that this thing is uh, not something that we deal with every day. It comes once in a while. So, and uh, since uh, the facade landscape has been changing around the world and also in Kenya, we decided that one of the main strategies was that uh, we would collaborate with an international fabricator who would help us uh, be our backbone uh, in terms of technical support, et cetera. And uh, the second thing was that we must understand the specifications well and make sure that we comply to the technical specifications. And uh, another one of the strategies was that we decided that uh, if you want to work on a project of this level, you have to work with reputable suppliers who are reliable and have product uh, certified products that can uh, make sure that uh, they are uh, suitable for use. And also correct pricing is a very important thing. A project of this scale, it's very difficult to estimate what kind of unforeseen prices, price uh, uh, increments you would have, but uh, it's, it's very important to have this uh, done from before. And after the award, uh, once uh, we got the award, one of the main things was to uh, produce a responsibility matrix with the international facade contractor. Also learn effective project management skills from them and uh, be able to utilize, uh, uh, to do it a proper way. And uh, from the beginning, we wanted to identify the right systems to, and products to use. Uh, as Ian mentioned, we also did a facade mock-up in the Dubai uh, factory for the international fabricator that we tied up with. And another one of the uh, strategies that we also did uh, uh, do on this project is allowed independent quality inspection from the suppliers before and after, during and in after installation. So uh, why, do you, why collaborate with an international fabricator? So one of the main things is to boost the client confidence. Uh, so the client knows that what they're getting is something of an international level, because that, as I had mentioned, the Kenyan landscape of uh, the Kenyan uh, Nairobi has high rise buildings, but Britam Tower was the highest. In fact, it's the, still the tallest building in Central Africa, uh, and I think it's the third tallest in Africa. And uh, another reason was to work with an experienced team and uh, also hit the ground running because what we find with the international fabricators, they are so experienced that uh, when it comes to a project of this, they know exactly where to, what points to focus on. And uh, also quality control inspections was a, uh, a key part we learned from them. They came to our site, they, uh, they inspected what we did and made reports. Uh, now, in terms of this, you can see this image, we've got all the landmark projects of the world. 
And Britam Tower is nowhere near some of these high rise, but you can see on the bottom right, I've just sort of scaled where Britam would fit in. So it's uh, uh, not that big compared to the world landmarks, but it's the big for Nairobi is massive for Kenya. And uh, what we did, we done a, we collaborated with a company called Al Gurer Aluminium, uh, which uh, was one of the facade contractors that done the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Now, when we met with Al Gurer, they were, we received a massive uh, specification document as part of the tender. But by sitting with Al Gurer, they picked the most important things, and also they we we discussed how we will comply, what products we will use, how we will make sure that we satisfy the specification requirements and the performance requirements. So again, from the specifications, there were various uh, performance requirements like air infiltration, water penetration, wind resistance, wind resistance safety, et cetera. So the idea is that whatever we propose, we have to comply to what are the specifications. And uh, working with reputable suppliers is the key. So these are just some of uh, the suppliers that we work with. And uh, a lot of them are well-known companies. Uh, also, they do take part in the ZAC events and uh, a lot of their products are well known. So aluminium system was the German company called Le Hook. Uh, then there was NBK, which is a Hunter Douglas company, who supplied the terracotta. AGC was the company that supplied the glass. Uh, it was a laminated high performance glass. Colt was the company that supplied the louvers, the rain defense louvers. Saint Gobain was the company that supplied the uh, fire rated doors. Uh, Lionweld Miser was the company that supplied the uh, walkway gratings. SE Controls is a, a, a British company that supplied us the, a, the actuators for window and smoke control. Uh, Gizeh supplied us the revolving door. And Kinlong is a Chinese company that supplied us a lot of the stainless steel items uh, that were used for the sailing baguettes. So the, once we got the project, we made a responsibility matrix with the Algorera Aluminium. And there was uh, various, uh, there's 12 criteria, as you can see on the left-hand side, design, procurement, fabrication, shipping, etc. And uh, on the and there's uh, the, the last two columns are uh, what who was responsible for what. This was at the initial stage. And on the right-hand side, there was a structure of how we all uh, fit together, where Algorea comes in and where we come in. And uh, eventually, the responsibility matrix was uh, much more detailed. Uh, you can see on the right hand side, it changed from a 12 uh, criteria item to uh, a massive list of who is responsible, who is giving input, who is approving, who is managing. And that's what we eventually signed with our group. Uh, now, in terms of project management, also one of the things that how we hit the ground running is to take a project overview and identify the scope of the work. So uh, initially there was the curtain walling was around 16,700 square meters of curtain walling. And we had selected the Hube Trigon system, which is a stick curtain wall system. Uh, again, it was a Hube aluminum system. It's called the Hube Lambda, which was for the windows and doors inside the curtain walling. Uh, for the grating, as I mentioned, there was a company called Lionel Miser, which is uh, based in Dubai. And uh, for the baguettes, there was a, uh, NBK, they supplied the terracotta. And uh, the good thing with this system is that it's a complete system. All the accessories, components, everything is supplied from them. And uh, they provide engineering as well. And in terms of the program, what we did was we broke down the program into four different, uh, three different areas. There was the design and engineering, uh, the procurement phase, the fabrication and installation phase. And all of that feeds into an overall program. And it were uh, the initial stages, this was around uh, uh, two year, two and a half year project uh, for facade, just uh, installation and uh, fabrication of facade. So it was a big project. Manpower and resources, we had to plan from the beginning. And you can see the uh, uh, chart on the left is a manpower chart. Uh, during the initial stages, there's not much manpower. Then it peaks in the middle from month uh, 15 to month 26. There's a huge amount of manpower on site. And the graph on the right is the S, uh, S curve which is the progress chart. Now, as, as Ian mentioned, we did do a facade mock-up in the Dubai factory. Uh, so we picked an area, you can on the top left is an image of the 15th floor of the facade. Then we produce shop drawings for that. And uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the shop drawings. Uh, the different details were all uh, uh, made and engineered to suit. And on the bottom, bottom left, you can see the 3D image of what the eventual outcome would be. And this was the facade mock-up inspection. It was a great event. Uh, the whole team was there. 
from the main contractor to the architect to the uh, lead architect from uh, South Africa, Ian was also there. The suppliers were there, Hunter Douglas, uh, Hook was there. Uh, the glass supplier was there as well from AGC. And also it, it gave a good, uh, good opportunity for the team to see the full-scale mock-up from the inside, from the outside. You can inspect the different components, uh, see the fixing details, etc. A lot of comments came out of this and it was all useful and positive. Uh, another of the strategies was quality control. So these are just screenshots of uh, the El Gorer site inspection. So the idea was they come to site, they inspect the work that we do. They make sure that we're using the right components that were in the shop drawings uh, that were provided by the suppliers. They make sure that uh, the next inspection, when it happens, the comments of the previous inspection are addressed first before they embark on the next inspection. Uh, making And also problems do arise. So problems were realized then how we sort them out, uh, the missing components, etc. We bring them in. This is another inspection uh, that was done at later stages. And as you can see, the it's quite a structured process, which was a bit new to us at the time because we were not of that level of a fabricator. Facade elements to work together. So this is a, a, an image of uh, the model of the, of the CGI of the uh, Britam Tower. So you can see there's a terracotta rain screen, which is a uh, suspended, cantilevered away from the facade. You've got an inclined curtain wall. You've got a straight curtain wall. Uh, there's ACP cladding. And then there's a terracotta framework. So there's a framework which is actually holding the terracotta. There's the louvers, which Ian mentioned, is there inside, the, there within the curtain wall. There's a steel structure holding the terracotta rain screen. And there's a walkway, uh, which is on top of the uh, steel. And then there's also facade lighting. This was a scope, not in, not in our scope, but uh, something that we had to integrate within the facade system. So the facade concept was, uh, there's a, this is a cross section. Uh, there was floor to floor glazing, as you can see the red highlighted area, and there were openable vents within the uh, curtain wall glazing. There's a maintenance platform on the bottom right. Uh, the terracotta rain screen, which is cantilevered around 750 away from the facade. And there's a permanent ventilation louvers, which Ian also mentioned uh, that allow um, for ventilation and for the extract. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the key was the cross section, how, we, how do we put everything together? So you can, uh, <clears throat> this is an image of how we had the terracotta, the grating, the louvers, the glass, the kernel, everything comes together, even the steel structure. And one of the key details was this uh, detail of the, we had an I-beam on top of which there was Metis grating. And also there was a casting anchor. And the casting anchors were casted before the concrete was poured and we had positioned them on each of the floors. And uh, this is, a, and also Britam Tower is interesting because there's an inclined facade. Uh, you can see the, this cross section has an inclined I-beam, inclined terracotta and also inclined uh, curtain wall glazing. Uh, this is a typical elevation of uh, a particular floor. Uh, you can see the various openables. Uh, there's a hatch door for maintenance access also in uh, the middle over there. And uh, there's louvers, high level louvers as well for ventilation. So I just want to show you uh, the detail number 10, which is, uh, so on the left hand side is a detail that we worked with the Colt. Uh, Colt provided us with all the uh, CAD details and how we put them into the project uh, curtain wall system. And on the right hand side, we have a cross section of the actual curtain wall as how we, from the shop drawing, how we built it. And you can see the louvers are within integrated into the curtain wall system. And there's a horizontal pressure plate and cover cap that uh, uh, holds it together. Now, Britam Tower was a complex project because of the shape. Uh, these are four elevations, the north, south, east, west. And uh, these are the inclined elevations, the north, east, the south, east, the southwest, and the north, uh, northwest. So every elevation was different. The glass, uh, you can see the green highlighted uh, areas is the glass on the corner. And uh, these had to be measured uh, separately. Uh, we had to take measurements for each and one, each and every one separately. Uh, this is a terracotta rain screen, which is uh, 
the, the Terabata framework actually, which will be holding the Terabata, which will be surmount, uh, uh, mounted onto the I-beams. So everything has to line up. So this is the curtain wall, and then this is the, this uh, slide is where the, the three things come together, the framework, the curtain wall system, the I-beams and the Terracotta framework. Uh, now just an installation journey, how we went through the project. So you can see an image of the casting anchors on the left-hand side. Uh, they were pre-cast before the, uh, they were pre-mounted into the uh, steel, uh, steel reinforcement. Yeah, one of our guys is there fixing it. And on the right hand side, there's an image as the building went up, the, the casting happened, but these were already in place. And uh, so you can see at the bottom bottom right, uh, how the casting, casting anchor is mounted. And then the I-beam comes and fits onto that. One of the reasons why we did this is that there were around 300,000 I-beams on the project. And you can see one casting anchor has four bolts. That would have meant 12,000 bolts that would be drilling from the outside of the building. Uh, in terms of man hours, we calculated that is, is just, we're just gonna be drilling for eight months uh, to get the balls in. So we decided to go about it this way. Uh, then the steel grating and the walkway, this is uh, images of the steel grating and the walkway installation. Uh, you, know, you can see the steel is being mounted first and then the grating comes on top of that. Now the, the I-beams were, were unique for every scenario because of the shape of the building. Uh, the edge I-beams had to be custom made. So you can see the three uh, just examples that I've shown below. Each I-beam had the different shape and size to hold, the, to hold everything together. Uh, this was the installation of the aluminum framework and glass. Uh, as we went on, we, took, we picked elevation wise. Uh, also the terracotta screen started coming in uh, from which for, for the areas that were uh, as we work up. Uh, then uh, once the aluminium was uh, at an advanced stage, then the uh, terracotta fixing started. So you can see the image on the left at the bottom side, you can see the shape of the building coming up with the diagonal. But as you go up, we were building the line, the diagonal line, because the lining was uh, very important. Make sure everything aligns together. Uh, you can see the image in the middle where uh, we've maintained a consistent gap for the corner glass, which is uh, not sun shaded. Uh, we had to make sure that everything lines up and all, all, all the elevations connect together well. And on the right hand side, you can see more images of the terracotta installation. Uh, now, another one of the lessons learned is that uh, having the, when you get the right supplies, you get the right solutions. So this is just a quick snapshot of uh, what Hunter Douglas provided for us. Uh, they supply only the terracotta. They don't supply the vertical fixing members, but they made sure that whatever they, whatever we, uh, do install it is structurally calculated so they done the structural calculation for us you can see the bending diagrams on the right hand side of the top and from that they provided us the the size of the members and the thickness of the aluminium that was to be used and uh, by doing this we they they are sure and we are sure that there's going to be no room for failure in the, in the future uh, another one of the again right suppliers right solution this is another structural calculation that we did with al uh, you can see the on the left hand side of the top is the facade framework, typical area, and the, the bending diagrams and the deflections that would happen if uh, it was to face the extreme weather conditions. And on the, all the bending moment analysis, the, the bolts, the right bolts, make sure that we do the right things is, is all pre-calculated. And this is one of the advantages of having someone like Earl Gurer on board is that the, the solutions are ready with them and you don't have to think about it or do a trial and error. It's ready, it's engineered, and it's tested. Uh, so another one of the lessons learned is the flex flexibility is key. So you can see the image on the right-hand side where I've taken a picture of the terracotta and the corner glass. Now for everything to line up, we had to make sure the I-beams which are going on to the casting anchors have flexibility X, Y, Z movement. Uh, for a building of this size, buildings do move. So you have to make sure that uh, we have enough room for us to uh, be able to accommodate any major uh, movements of the uh, or misalignments during the casting, etc. Uh, another one of the lessons learned is that some things can only be done on site. So as I mentioned earlier, the corners were the biggest challenge. You can see an image on the uh, uh, left-hand side of the top where we've installed the glass. 
Now, every glass that is installed in that uh, image is a different size and shape. And that goes for every elevation, every corner, for every floor for this building. So we had to take measurements you know, using a digital protractor, do the special cutting on site. Uh, and then from that, we make uh, AutoCAD drawings. And then the AutoCAD drawings for the glasses, for the corners, then go to the glass processor, who then makes it on a uh, CNC machine. And uh, that, that was a challenge. Normally, uh, we would, either, we would op use on a auto, we would do it from the model. But in this instance, you can't actually do that because uh, everything was different. Uh, the final outcome, obviously, by working with reliable suppliers, you get warranties, so we could hand the warranties back to the client. There was system warranty for the aluminum system. There was glass warranty for the performance coated glass. There was a warranty for the one hour fire rated doors. Also, Colt had given a guarantee of the uh, rain defense uh, system that they have. Uh, and this is the final outcome. So you can see the project is a fantastic project. It rises above the lot of the Nairobi skyline. The picture in the middle, you can see hanging baguettes. Uh, that was a very unique uh, installation that we did. Uh, it is like a necklace. Uh, it's a very unique design also from the architect to have uh, decided to design that. Uh, more images. This is a picture from Nairobi National Park. So the Britam Tower, as you can see, stands out. You can see it from the uh, uh, Nairobi National Park. Uh, and also another image, uh, a tower in front of, ta a giant in front of giant. So you can see very nice images on uh, the, uh, the project. Another image of the project. Uh, we have a rhino in the Britain Tower in the background. So that's uh, my quick presentation. Uh, Ad? Yep, I'm here. We'll take some questions, Ian. Can I request you to uh, turn your camera back on? And uh, yeah, we'll take some questions. Um, just a second, let me just uh, get my settings right. Uh, right. Um, so uh, the first question, uh, Ian, uh, is, uh, uh, have you done any post-occupancy power demand to check uh, uh, if the building performance was uh, at par uh, as planned? No, not yet. We haven't got any data uh, available. Um, obviously, in due course, we'd hope that um, Britain would help to, to share that with us. Um, I mean, the building is obviously, it's got tenants in it. Tenants have been moving in um, since the end of uh, uh, 2019. Uh, sorry, probably 20, 2018. So, yeah, we hope to collect that data in, in, in due course. And, and also, to be honest, probably more important than the energy data is understanding how people are reacting and responding with the natural ventilation and the daylighting um, in, right. in the in this building as well. Right. Okay. Mm, uh, why was terracotta used as the uh, shading fin? Uh, were uh, other materials also uh, looked at like aluminium uh, or something else uh, before finalizing terracotta? Sorry, did you did you hear me? I mean, I, I, mean, I think that architecturally, I think they had a it had an aesthetic um, quality as well, which 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 they, which they liked. Um, certainly, from a you know budget was always a, a and always was going to be a challenge with this type of project in in, in that location, and uh, uh, that was reviewed as well. But I think you know I think Britain were were good in supporting the team and and the architects in terms of trying to pursue something a little bit little bit different. Um, but um, yeah, it, it was under constant um, scrutiny and, and looking for pieces of value, value engineering. But it didn't happen at the end. Okay. Um, was uh, So you mentioned that uh, the project had uh, single glazed laminated glass. Okay. Um, was it uh, not a strategy to go for double glaze to increase the energy performance a little bit better? Um, I mean, I think we could have got, you know, obviously further improvements with a double glazed solution, but I think um, given the relatively temperate conditions and I suppose particularly the, um, you know, the lack of a, a true winter, um, which would have demanded a heating requirement, 
Um, I, I think the, um, you know, the money was probably better spent elsewhere in terms of the shading and making sure that we had the, the right amount of openings in the, in the facade and so on. So um, given, given the budget, I think the money was spent in, 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 the, right, in the right place. Okay. Um, take this uh, one for you. Uh, why was a stick uh, system chosen when uh, you have uh, an international contractor like Algorair who also uh, specializes in unitized systems, which would have been easier for transportation and installation? So one of the reasons why stick was considered because of uh, the ease of fabrication based on the project, they they recommended that stick system is right for this. Plus there was a terracotta connection to the outside in the steel structure. So having these connections onto a unitized system would prove a challenge. So the slide that I showed where we had cast in anchors, which was holding the I-beam and the terracotta, uh, Al Gure's recommendation was to have that independent of the curtain walling, uh, just right. because of the weight and uh, flexibility and also the shape of the building. Also taking a whole terracotta, in fact, the mock-up, they tried to do it in a unitized way, by the way in the Algorez factory, it failed miserably. The terracotta almost fell down. They, they tried to lift the whole panel as one, but then we decided to have individual terracotta members applied one by one. Uh, so it was a recommendation from Algre. I think it was the right recommendation actually, because a unitized system right. would be quite complicated. Right. Um, so how is the uh, facade uh, cleaned? Uh, is it cleaned uh, with the BMU or do you have uh, people cleaning it uh, between the, uh, you have a cavity, right? Between the terracotta and uh, the, the main structure. So is it uh, cleaned that way? Yeah, it's cleaned via the, via the walkway. So I think Dev showed the, uh, the access doors that there are on each of the uh, elevations. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's where the maintenance guys can get out onto the, uh, onto the deck. Right. Um, okay. Uh, the next one was, um, are all the uh, operables uh, automated or there are also uh, manually uh, uh, open? No, no, they're all um, manual. Um, I mean, again, clearly we would have had advantages if, if they'd been automated, perhaps particularly one set, the upper... Uh, the upper set had been automated, but um, the budget really didn't didn't run to that. And and actually, the high level ones are not they're not too high. Um, they're, they're they're you know they are reachable basically from from low level. So um, it, it works okay. I think it's it's a little bit compromising with what case of what it could be, um, but still performs adequately. Right, um, Dave. I'll take this one uh, for you. Um... Uh, were there any particular procurement challenges you faced? Of course, you've got the, most of the items right, uh, collaborating with an international contractor, uh, getting the right suppliers, but uh, were there any procurement challenge, uh, ch uh, procurement challenges you faced uh, for the facade uh, elements? And uh, what about uh, uh, skilled labor uh, availability in a country like Kenya? How were you able to manage uh, this project? So the first question, were there any procurement challenges? So there was a procurement challenge for the glass, actually. So initially, like Ian mentioned, there were, the glass was specified as a PPG glass. Okay. The Solexia Solaban is a PPG glass. Now, in, in Kenya, the, the, what we found is that PPG are not represented, and they were not too interested in the market when we went to visit them and went to have started okay. discussion. They said the Africa is not part of our region, and we don't want we, if you want to use our glass, there's this certain protocol that you have to follow. So, so then we opted to go for a different supplier, which is AGC, who has presence in the market. And they have right. a glass that uh, could meet, uh, we were just near about uh, the solar factors that uh, Ian had demanded for. And, but that was a, it was a challenge. We, we managed to get through it. There was a lot of back and forth at the time. Uh, eventually, uh, AGC provided us with a glass that uh, is, is called Planibel A. Which is, which is a low E coated glass. And it's only for the, they use it in Europe. It's a hard coated glass. So there's no, there's no uh, uh, processing difficulties. So we can process it locally as well. Uh, so that, that was, uh, that was a, one of the challenges that we faced. The, the second question in terms of skilled labor. Yes, there is a shortage of skilled labor uh, over here. 
and especially senior level people like project managers and technical site coordinators. We did uh, bring in a lot of people from abroad, uh, experienced, uh, experienced uh, project managers from uh, people who've got experience in Dubai, also in India, because Mumbai also has become a high rise uh, uh, capital right. as well at the moment. So a lot of people did come from there on contract basis. And uh, that's how we operated the project. Right. Um, so ne- I'll take this next one for Ian. So how easy was it uh, collaborating, uh, you know, with people in different parts of the world? You had the architect from South Africa, the project in Kenya, a lot of other uh, suppliers and uh, components coming from other parts of the world. How And you were based in the UK. How easy was this uh, Close uh, this uh, close collaboration with people from different uh, locations. I think it, I think it works ex- extremely well. Um, the team was very motivated to to produce a great building for for our client. Um, our client had deliberately gone out to to international an international team in the first place because they wanted to bring that international expertise to bear on on the project. Um, and I think it's a, a way everybody, all the consultants were, were used to, to working and they understood the processes um, and the way in which we could collaborate. So obviously we had, you know, very regular uh, meetings uh, in, in Nairobi. Um, we had good, good modeling techniques, which helped the communication as well through the, through the design process. Um, but I think it was really it's just that spirit of wanting to get get the get the job get the job done and a team that's prepared to work together and spend time together um, to achieve that that objective. So I think you know obviously London is is a reasonable distance from Nairobi, but to be honest, at the time uh, the architects coming from South Africa still had a, a four hour flight to get there, so they weren't particularly local either. So you know I think. Right. Every, because of that, there was that genuine international flavor to the project uh, right from right from the out. Right. Uh, I'll take the last question for Dave. Uh, so uh, were there any specific issues related uh, to uh, cladding wind pressures uh, at uh, higher elevations, uh, something which uh, you had to uh, factor for a, for a place like Nairobi? Uh, not really. We didn't face uh, many, uh, many wind factors, actually. But uh, we did take precautions for that because Al Gurair being there, they told us that at such heights, you can't take risks. So all these uh, special cages were made on the edge of the building for us to install glass. Uh, precautions were taken, but as such, we didn't face any, any issues uh, like that. Uh, fortunately, we finished the project without any major incidents in terms of health and safety. So that was a positive thing. Uh, but a lot of the health and safety protocol was uh, guided to us by uh, by Al Gurer uh, in terms of harnesses and all that. Right. So, okay. So that brings us to our end of uh, this session. Our one hour is over. So I'd like to thank our uh, speakers. I would like to uh, thank Ian. I would like to thank Dave uh, for their lovely insight on uh, building the Britain Tower facade. Uh, and uh, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, and uh, I hope to see you all in uh, person very soon. So uh, take care, stay safe. Cheers.